Now coming to the stage Mauro Porcini, the first ever chief design officer at PepsiCo, where he aims to infuse deep design thinking into every aspect of the company's culture. He's joined by moderator Musa Tariq, renowned marketing expert who's worked with Apple, Ford Motors, and Airbnb, for a conversation on the art and science of design. How are you, everyone? Okay, I'll just let you Hello. guys all get a bit settled from uh, your little coffee, your break. Um, you're, in, you're in for a good one. I've spent uh, the last couple of days listening to Maro's podcast interviews, uh, and I've written pages and pages of notes. So uh, we're really excited that you're here. Uh, Mara, you, you've been at PepsiCo 10, 12 years now, and you've had eight different bosses. <laughs> when, you're, when they meet you for the first time or you're onboarding, what is it that you say that you do and the role of your team? Um, first of all, thanks for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what I tell them is that we are so much more than designers. We are not in the company just to design pretty products, beautiful packaging, incredible experiences. To enable all of this, to be able to do what I just said, you need, first of all, to design the right culture. And to synthesize what that culture is for me and for us as a design organization is the idea of a culture based on people in love with people. Is, is the subtitle of my book, The Human Side of Innovation, The Power of People in Love with People. There are three forms of love. The first one is the love for the people we serve, users, customers, consumers, whatever you want to call them. I love to call them people, human beings. Being obsessed with creating extraordinary products, solutions, packaging, experiences for them. So really falling in love with them, looking at them like if they were your kids, your parents, your friends, and, and being obsessed with creating something that is really meaningful for them. In an industry like the one of food and beverage, for instance, is trying to understand how to change the portfolio of the company and to change the industry to be more sustainable, uh, more focused on health and wellness, more customized, personalized, engaging for people. So this is the first form of love. The second one is the love for what we do. You know, we're gonna bring, you know, we are people passionate about what we do. We're not in the company just to arrive at the end of the year, uh, have our performance review, get our good rating, our salary increase. We are here for the long run. And no matter what is that brief in the long term, we are always driven by this dream of creating something meaningful for people. And finally, pe love for the people surrounding you. The uh, people in other functions, in marketing, in R&D, in the different parts of the company. This is what designers do. They are connectors. Uh, and they connect functions, other people, other capabilities, once again, with a focus on the people we serve. This is what we learn at school. Now, all of this could be a nice to have or totally unnecessary in many companies. Could have been totally unnecessary and nice to have in many companies for many, many years. But there is something that is changing radically today, and it's been changing now for, for, a, for a few years. Companies like PepsiCo don't compete anymore just with a renowned, obvious competitor, you know, as big as our company or few competitors in the market. The big barriers to entry that we used to have to protect our businesses, our brands, are crumbling down under the winds of globalization, new technologies, digitization. So today, anybody can come up with an idea, get easy access to funding for that idea through the proliferation of investment funds, uh, incubators, even companies like ours looking for the next startup, the next big idea to invest on. So getting access to money is easier than in the past. The cost of manufacturing, of creating the product, physical or digital, you know, whatever it is, is going down, driven yes. again by globalization and new technologies and the role of digital. And then you can sell your ideas, your products, your solutions to people through the commerce and you can communicate uh, your brands through the social media platform, uh, through, uh, through the digital world. And so in these areas, 
big corporations used to build their barriers to entry made of scale of production, communication, distribution. Therefore, in this world today, the only competitive advantage you can build for companies big and small, the only obsession you should have above anything else should be the obsession and the love for the people you serve. Not thinking, well, I'm going to grow my business, I'm going to increase my market share, I'm going to invest in, in these adjacencies because of the... No, you need to be driven authentically by the need of creating something meaningful, valuable for people. This is what they teach you at design school. At design school, they teach you to create something cool, meaningful, extraordinary, beautiful, functional, convenient for people. Then they tell you, by the way, you need also to sell this stuff to them. So they teach you a little bit of business. In business school, they teach you something very different. They teach you to grow a business, to grow a brand. And they tell you you have multiple levers. One of these levers is your product. It, then you have your brand, you have pricing, you have distribution. But you can be successful as a business leader. Your business can be incredible, incredibly successful, or at least it could have been incredibly successful, even if your product was mediocre, if you had the right distribution strategy with the right barriers to entry, if you have patents to protect your products, and so on and so forth. Today, the kind of luxury, thank God, I would say, is not there anymore. You need to create something valuable for people. If you don't do it, sooner or later, somebody else will do it for you in your industry. So yes, I found this truth in the design world. I realized that actually was the most powerful asset, strategic asset that designers will bring to a company. So that's what I pitch to my bosses and to the companies I work for. But then obviously, it's not just about designers, else we wouldn't go anywhere. So this culture that you can find in the design world needs to be a culture that is spread across the organization, marketing, sales, strategy, R&D, all the functions. Now, in marketing, I'm sure there are many business leaders here, marketers here. You find people like this. It's not that you don't find them, but it's not the typical culture of that community. And this community, therefore, needs to evolve and change and put people first and business after with a deep, profound understanding of the business levers and variables, but really starting with this authentic obsession for creating the best possible product for uh, the people we serve. Wow. Um, we might need a couple of hours here, because um, <laughs> I want to go deep. Um, also, we also need to talk about your shoes. It's on the list of things <laughs> to do. Uh, because even as an ex-Nike guy, those are pretty impressive. Um, They're talk Adidas we yeah. got ta Talking about love, um, can you talk about a, a, a project that you've worked on that you have loved? Um, look, in our industry, but this is true for so many different industries around the world, there are four different levers that are driving change and are driving innovation. Sustainability, health and wellness, personalization, and then the fourth one is more of an enabler of this, uh, that is the role of technology. Technology yeah. being many things, digitization, AI, data, many, many different things. So when I entered the company, there was a project, I, I will start with a failure, <laughs> and then I'll tell you a success. Um, I was like, okay, I come in this company, the CEO back then in Dranui was all about sustainability, health and wellness, uh, under the strategy that she called performance with purpose. And still today, our CEO, Ramon Laguarta, with Pet Positive, same kind of obsession for this kind of approach. So I was like, wow, you know, new to the company, we're gonna change the industry, you know, with the leadership of the CEO. I come in the company, and one of the first projects I work on is what, we later called Drinkfinity. So the brand that went to market is called Drinkfinity. Drinkfinity was, so one of the problems in our industry is plastic. So we decided to create a bottle that was reusable. So check, <laughs> now we have a reusable bottle. You don't ship products anymore because you can fill the bottle with tap water if you're lucky enough to live in a place, in a country where you have access to clean water. And then you had pods, recyclable, with natural ingredients, um, focusing on two uh, kind of needs. One is more of a desire, so the flavors I like. Different kind of flavors, we have incredible R&D that can develop really good flavors, uh, you know, research on trends, what were the trendy flavors. And then the other one is more of a functional need, so some functional ingredient, turmeric, matcha, uh, a variety of others, 
uh, they could give you energy or relaxing and so on and so forth. So you could get the perfect drink for you, personalized for what you need, for what you want, in a sustainable kind of ecosystem. If I was doing this project at school, I would, get, I would have got, you know, best grades ever. I mean, it's just the solution to the industry, right? We commercialize it in Brazil. Uh, that it, often we use test market to test ideas. It, it, it doesn't work very well for our standards. Keep in mind that we're talking about a company with 20 plus brands that are above a billion dollar of revenue. And, and, and 40 brands on top of this between the 250 millions and the billion. So for us, success means that in a few years you reach at least 300, 400 million dollars. And you start to see in the very first year, you know, that the trajectory is that one. So uh, it doesn't work. We try also in the US, e-commerce channel, it doesn't work. At the point that some media channels over the years have been pointing at the project as a failure. You see, design thinking in PepsiCo, yes. Is it really working for innovation? Look at Drinkfinity. And, and that kind of perspective is so myopic. Mm -hmm. Because while they were writing this, they were not observing other things that were happening in the company. And this is another problem that I find in the business community. For 10 years, I've been working in a tech company, in 3M, the Minnesota mining manufacturing based in, uh, in Minnesota, uh, together with thousands of scientists. You know, for a scientist, it's obvious that to arrive to one innovation, to one patent, you need to do thousands of experiments. When you are in the business world, those experiments are called failures or mistakes. If we are serious about innovation, especially considering that the rate of failure of innovation in corporations, depending on the research you check, the data, the data you, you take in consideration, is anyway between 70 to 90 percent. Mm -hmm. So innovation keeps failing continuously in these companies. Maybe we need to change vocabulary. Maybe we need to change, to do that, we also need to change culture, processes. We need to understand that you need to prototype, you need to experiment, and not just behind the scenes, but eventually also in market. Maybe through the e-commerce channel that is giving us new opportunities or in different kind of countries if you are, you are a multinational corporation. And you need to build a system not to punish the people that are making these mistakes slash experiments. Uh, to pro you need to protect corporate reputation in front of customers, consumers, shareholders. I mean, you need a full system to do that. But the point is you need to innovate. Uh, you need to experiment. You need to uh, try things to innovate. So anyway, here we are. The infinity didn't work. And we're like, why? I mean, you look at research, and everybody tells you that you need sustainable solutions in our industry. You go online, and everybody's accusing these corporations of polluting the world. Blah, blah. So why, once we create something that makes sense for people, they don't buy it? And the reason is that you know this very well. One thing is what they say and what they try to rationalize. One thing is what they do and their behaviors. The problem of Dreamfinity is that in that specific moment, by the way, Dreamfinity may work in 20 years' time, but in that specific moment, in the culture of the world in that moment, in, the, in those countries, people didn't want to take the trade-off in convenience of carrying a bottle with them. Now, I'm saying that in the future it may work because, thank God, our kids are going to school with reusable bottles. They're getting used to, you know, to that. They're yeah. changing habits. But in general, back then, for the masses, this was not working. So that's when we realized that we still needed to invest in those kind of solutions. They're really important. That's why, for instance, we acquired SodaStream. Yeah. You know, it was a major acquisition for us. So we still need to invest in that. But we need to figure out how to add additional value so that if you have a trade-off in convenience, you're going to buy the solution because there is something more that you're getting out of the solution. And that's where how we invented Gatorade GX. Gatorade GX is an ecosystem where you have Gatorade, the sport drink that you probably are familiar with. You have these um, uh, smart patches that you put on your skin, so these wearable technologies that monitor your sweating amount of sweating and composition during your performance as an athlete. And then they send information to an app. The app suggests you what kind of Gatorade is perfect for you on the base of your body, wow. your sweating. Then you get your Gatorade, uh, your concentrate of Gatorade in a pod. The system then is exactly like the Infinity. You have a reusable bottle. 
you put water, you put the pod, and you get your perfect Gatorade. Wow. The bottle is a smart bottle, I'm gonna close it, and so monitoring what you are, your intake, what you are drinking. And then we understood, so there was this functional additional benefit, and then on top of it, we realized that we needed to do more, and so very briefly, we started to add customization to the system. So today you can go to Gatorade.com, and you can put your name on the body of the bottle, on the cap, the name of your team, you can totally customize um, uh, the patterns, the graphic, and this is working very well. In the exporting goods, where we launched the product, we've been the best-selling SKU for two years in a row after launch. We're almost not present in, uh, in one of the biggest sport apparel yeah. retailers, and now we are the best-selling SKU in the, in the store. Wow. Um, uh, this is a question that I, I hadn't prepared, so I'm just going to go with it, but one of the things that has fascinated me about your career. I, I actually remember when it was announced that you were going to PepsiCo and I was like, okay, a design guy in a massive CPG company, this is not gonna work. And you've been there 12 years and in, in one of the interviews I heard you speak about this idea of not just speaking the language of design, but speaking the language of the people that you speak to. And, and I think that for marketers today, in a world where like our marketing is changing every minute, it's very easy for us to spew all this lingo and language and expect people to come along the journey with me. Like I remember when I was starting social media 15 years ago and trying to convince people to come on this journey with me, it wasn't easy. And, I, and it, the truth of the matter is there's still marketers today who have to convince people what they're doing. Can you talk a bit more about that like, that translation piece? You know, you, sa you said that like, if you're advertising to Italians, you have to advertise, have to understand Italians and speak in Italian. Can you speak about that from a, how you convey the design message within a, a big or, or organization like PepsiCo? Yeah. Look, uh, there are 24 different characteristics that define these people in love with people. I like to call them the unicorns. One of them is being polyglot, being able to speak different kinds of languages. Now, initially, it was more about me as a designer understanding the language of finance, the language of marketing, the language of R&D. R&D meaning, well, chem, you know, people working in chemistry. In, in PepsiCo is food uh, scientist and chef. And, and so understanding the different languages with their terminology, their words, what is important for them, and translate what I try to do through the design lens in something that is meaningful to them, relevant to them. That was the first step. So understanding someone else's motive before you're trying to sell your own. Well, that, that's the second okay. step. Oh. So the first step is, if I talk about marketing, I need to use marketing terminology. Got it. Because if I go to a marketing meeting and I start to talk as a designer will talk, it's like a Japanese talking to an Italian. I need to translate this idea of creation of love in brand engagement, productivity. Uh, in the book you will see that I, I connected kindness to the idea of productivity. We can talk later about this, but, but really, really doing an effort to understand what, are, what is the lingo that these people in front of me are talking, and how can I translate what I do and the value I bring you know, to the table with their vocabulary. But then, and that's where you are going, you need to understand what drives these people what is important for them. And not just in the business world, but in life. For instance, if you are a, a CMO of a company in a specific business, let's say you are the marketing lead for Pepsi. If your goal is to leave the company and go to another company because you understand that there is no space for you to grow in the organization because there are very established positions on top of you. Or if your goal is to become that CMO, or if your goal is to God knows what, or if you're you're living a moment in your life where you have troubles at all. You know, there is something going on with your kids or the school or somebody. Your decisions are partially influenced by that as well. Mm. It is not just a business goal. It's what happened in your life. So the truth is that to really be successful in an organization, you need empathy. Empathy in the etymological meaning of the word, from Greek, M. Pathos. So really putting yourself in the shoes of the people in front of you, feeling what they feel, and caring. You know, you may have empathy, but not care. Yeah. 
Uh, often we talk about consumer centricity, human centricity, and, and a lot of people translate that in, oh, I need, it's the role of consumer insights. I need to have data about what people want and, and understand, you know, do research, qualitative, quantitative, and on the basis of this I take my decisions. Well, yes, you need that because you need to observe people. But you need another thing, caring, caring. Because maybe you understand that somebody needs something, the consumer, the customer, in this case we are talking about your colleagues, your partners. Maybe you understand, but you don't give a shit. Sorry for the French. Instead, people that are kind, that have empathy, that care, well, then they will really, first of all, they will connect in levels that others don't. They will have a sensitivity that is extraordinary. And therefore, they will understand nuances, things that make the difference. And so, in connecting with all these different leaders within the organization, starting with the CEOs and the business leaders uh, that, that, that you mentioned earlier, all the way to my teams and everybody, every time I ask myself, what can I do to help you? Mm as a human being, yeah. and then help you as a business leader, as a designer. Now, if you find a way to help these people in their career journey within the company, in their difficult moments in life, and also, obviously, in the business goals, then you're going to become indispensable. They will, be, they will be the ones looking for you. Now, the beauty of this is, first of all, that if everybody does this, we're going to create a society within companies and outside of companies of people that care about each other. To do that, though, you need to care for real. You don't need to do it because you will become indispensable. Yeah. Because if you, do, if you play that game, you're not going to be authentic. People will feel it, and they won't, they won't, they won't come. So you need to start for, from a real position of kindness and love, and then things will get there. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I actually coach a lot of people and uh, leaders and actually ask them, do you know what your people in a team care about, what are they passionate about, and it's incredible how rare it is that a leader knows what every single person on their team care about and are passionate about. And for people on the team, I encourage them to be more vocal with their leaders about what they care about and what they're passionate about so they can find that consistency. Um, I'm going to talk about kindness um, because it, one of the things that you, you talk about is when you're looking for talent, right? So Mara has like an incredibly huge team. His remit is kind of phenomenal, and I, I don't even know how you do it all, but you, you emphasize this idea that you've got great teams and you trust people. The first thing you say is that you look for brilliant people, and I'd love to truly understand what are the types of people that you, you look to. And then you mention kindness as a key factor, and I think that in this day and age, we hear people like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk who weren't geniuses and brilliant at what they do, but they're not considered kind. And so most people associate great leadership with not being kind. Can you talk about like, that for yeah. us and try and like, Look, knock down that rumor? First of all, Musk, Jobs are exceptions because the way they run uh, their companies they, or they used to run in the case of Jobs, are unique and they are not scalable or repeatable in other companies. Um, today, in a world where you need to be hyper effective, hyper efficient, where everything runs at the speed of light, where yeah. you don't have those barriers to entry that we used to have, you need to figure out how to connect people in the most seamless and efficient way. Kindness is a an incredible driver to build synergies within a team. I'll give you a few examples. Um, if you are surrounded by people that are not kind to you, that you don't like, that they, that they don't care, what are the probabilities that you spend time with them uh, beyond the nine to five when you are at work? You know, you go to work nine to five and then you rush away. You don't wanna be with those people. If you are surrounded by people that you care about, they care about you, you will spend more time with them. It could be even the, the lunch break, it could be drinks after lunch. You will spend qualita qualitative time, quality time, and that quality time will be bonds that are so useful when the next day, the next week, the next month, you face a problem, a business problem, and you understand each other, you care about each other, you know that they're there for each other, you trust trust each other. The same, imagine you have a boss that is not really kind, that actually is a very tough person, is a shark. 
uh, what are the probability when this person is making a mistake that you're going to be there to help the person? Yeah. Now multiply that blind spot, that problem, because this is going to create a problem, for 300,000 employees in a company like PepsiCo and understand the level of lack of productivity and risk you're generating within the organization. Uh, and I could go on and on. You think of you know, one of the theories of management that we've been taught for many, many years, um, coaches and mentors have been teaching this or role modeling this in our organization, is the idea of putting people against each other. You know, you put one talent against the other, you put one part of the organization against the other, with the, the idea that the, the strongest idea will survive. This Darwinian kind of idea that the strongest idea will survive, will win. And, the reality is that that kind of approach is very inefficient. You know, you have teams or people doing the same things, or eventually when they don't trust each other, even when they work within a team, doing things to cover their back and yeah. that you don't want in an organization. Multiply them once again for hundreds of thousands of people in an organization and understand the lack of productivity. So when we talk about productivity in these companies, we talk about cutting costs, headcounts, resources, projects, a and Nobody ever talks about increasing productivity by investing in kindness that drives that kind of synergy within these, these teams and makes those teams super effective. Now, I came to this realization years ago uh, when at the beginning of my PepsiCo journey, I was building this new teams in the company. I'm the first ever chief design officer of the company, the same in 3M, so the teams are new. So by definition, they were stepping on the toes of marketing, R&D, all the other functions, because the company was doing design anyway in the past without an internal function. So you were pissing off everybody. So, and a filter that I used from the very beginning, because I was using it at 3M, and then I took it to Pepsi, I gave it to HR, the filter, the requirement number zero, I wanted to have kind people, good human beings, good people. By the way, I wanted, because I just wanted to be surrounded by these kind of people, because I work well with those kind of people. I had the luxury, in all the complexity of building a new function, I had the luxury of choosing my people. So I wanted them to have that kind of behavior. After a while, when business leaders started to come to me, telling me, Oh, to work with your team is such a pleasure. Ah. We love to work with them. They're so nice, they're so kind, they're so collaborative. They're so... I was like, wow, this is actually an added value. We are, we have been able to build and infiltrate, and build this capability and infiltrate the company also through kindness, through the kind of empathy that we have. And so that's when I realized that I needed to double down on this and pitch it beyond the design organization as an incredible value for any culture, any function, any human being. Amazing. Well, um, we're at time. Um, I would recommend that you Google this man and listen to his podcast. That, like, I've got a man crush on him uh, for a reason. And, and that, I'm shivering not because I'm nervous. It's very cold up here. But it's good <laughs> shivers. Um, thank you for being such a great role model as a leader to so many of us in terms of the importance of putting kindness up there. Not enough. People speak about it. I know you speak about it a lot. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that.